Evolving Paradigms in Atopic Dermatitis Hello everyone, and thank you for tuning in. In this episode, we discuss atopic dermatitis across the age spectrum with Dr. Fernanda Schmidt. Dr. Schmidt, what are the inside-out and outside-in mechanisms of AD? So I believe that understanding well the physiopathology is key for successful treatment of any disease, but that is especially true for atopic dermatitis, which is a very complex and a multifactorial condition. There are so many different avenues to intervene as a clinician when treating those patients, and the most successful treatment plans, they typically include addressing not only the alterations in the skin, but also in the immune system and the nervous system, the environmental exposures, just to name a few of them. So I try to highlight in my lecture this year the Masters of Pediatric Dermatology that we currently see the skin as much more than just a physical barrier that protects us uh, from aggressions from the outside environment, that helps us with temperature regulation. The skin is a very active immunologic organ as well, and it plays a very important role not only for atopic dermatitis, but for other atopic diseases as well, such as food allergies and potentially asthma. These two theories you mentioned, they try to explain how all those different factors, they play a role in the the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis. So the inside-out theory proposes that inciting event is an abnormality in the immune system, which leads to an increased risk of IgE-mediated sensitization to various allergens. And this resulting inflammation would lead to a disruption on the epithelial barrier and consequently the signs and the symptoms of atopic dermatitis that we know so well. The paritis, the erythema, the scales, the exudate. The outside in theory, on the other hand, which is the, it's currently the, the theory that's most accepted um, to explain the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis. It proposes that the primary defect is an intrinsic alteration of components of the skin barrier, and this alteration in the permeability and selectivity of the barrier would allow for an increased penetration and increased exposure to environmental antigens, bacteria, and even foods, and that would in turn lead to inflammation and subsequent Ig sensitization in some of our patients. So obviously, these are very simplistic um, explanations, very simple uh, ways to put it. There, there's many more components involved, such as genetic mm-hmm. factors and behavioral factors as well, uh, amongst other things. Is there a difference between these mechanisms across the age spectrum, from children to adults? Yes, there are some differences, and I think it's important to mention that there are some structural differences. For example, the epidermis on the infants and the young kids is much thinner than in adults. There are some immunologic uh, immaturities as well, and there are also some functional differences in the barrier. So, for example, young kids, they will have a lower content of natural moisturizing factor. They have a higher pH, which is not desirable. And uh, that's seen mostly on the babies, and there uh, is more of a tendency, obviously, over the years to achieve what we see with the adults. But those changes that we see in those very young kids, they make them more susceptible to the sensitization uh, that we talked about in the, the outside in theory. And that would explain, at least in part, why a greater percentage of the, the patients affected by atopic dermatitis are the, the young children. There is a topic dermatitis that starts in the adults, but some studies have found that uh, about 60% of the kids, of the patients with a topic dermatitis, they actually develop the, develop the disease very early on uh, before 12 months of age. Can we halt the atopic march by repairing the skin, or is it more than skin deep? So this is subject of a lot of recent discussion, and I personally believe that both of your statements, they might be correct in a certain way. 
considering the outside in theory, considering that that is correct, repairing the barrier, which can be achieved by a gentle skincare regimen, by the use of appropriate emollients, by using uh, the correct soap for the mildly acidic pH, for example. So that would be considered essential to treat the dermatitis and would possibly even prevent transcutaneous sensitization to food. And this has been demonstrated in some uh, studies with animals. And to illustrate that a little bit, there are two studies that have been published in 2014 which demonstrated that for infants with high risk of atopic dermatitis, and they defined high risk of atopic dermatitis, uh, the presence of a parent or, or a sibling in the same family with atopic dermatitis as well. So those high-risk infants, they received daily applications of emollients all over their skin for the first six months of life. And for those infants, there was a reduction in the risk of developing atopic dermatitis over life. One of these studies actually uh, asked, looked as well into the levels of IgE antibodies against egg. And although there was not a direct reduction in those levels in the patients that had the applications of emollients for the first six months of life, only the children who did end up developing dermatitis were found to have the, the higher, highest levels uh, of those antibodies. So indirectly, by preventing the eczema, we would have a reduction um, of those levels of sensitization, even though directly we can demonstrate that. So what we do know right now is that this early emollient therapy in the high-risk infants is a simple and is an effective way to reduce the risk of atopic dermatitis, but we do need to investigate a little bit more um, about the impact of this measure in preventing other diseases of the atopic march. But that highlights for me the importance of identifying those high-risk infants uh, in a timely manner and being able to establish this preventative therapy uh, to have a, a lifetime impact on them. Okay.